Chapter 8 of Black Amazon of Mars by Lee Brackett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twice before in his life Stark had come near to freezing. It had been like this, the numbness and the cold, and yet it seemed that the dark force had struck rather at his nerve centers than at his flesh. He could not see Kiara, who was behind him, but he heard the metallic clashing of her mail and one small whispered cry, and he knew that she had fallen too. The glowing creatures surrounded him. He saw their bodies bending over him, the frosty tendrils of their faces writhing as though in excitement or delight. Their hands touched him, little hands with seven fingers, deft and frail. Even his numbed flesh felt the terrible cold of their touch, freezing as outer space. He yelled, or tried to, but they were not abashed. They lifted him and bore him toward the tower, a company of them, bearing his heavy weight upon their gleaming shoulders. He saw the tower loom high and higher still above him. The cloud of dark force that crowned it blotted out the stars. It became too huge and high to see at all, and then there was a low, flat arch of stone close above his face, and he was inside. Straight overhead, a hundred feet, two hundred, he could not tell, was a globe of crystal fitted into the top of the tower as a jewel is held in a setting. The air around it was shadowed with the same eerie gloom that hovered outside, but less dense, so that Stark could see the smoldering purple spark that burned within the globe, sending out its dark vibrations. A globe of crystal with a heart of sullen flame. Stark remembered the sword of Ban Krushak, and the white fire that burned in its hilt. Two globes, the bright cord and the dark. The sword of Ban Krushak touched the blood with heat. The globe of the tower deadened the flesh with cold. It was the same force, but at opposite ends of the spectrum. Stark saw the cryptic controls of that glooming globe, a bank of them on a wide stone ledge just inside the tower close beside him. There were shining ones on that ledge tending those controls, and there were other strange and massive mechanisms there, too. Flying spirals of ice climbed up inside the tower, spanning the great stone well with spidery bridges, joining icy galleries. In some of those galleries Stark vaguely glimpsed rigid, gleaming figures like statues of ice, but he could not see them clearly as he was carried on. He was being carried downward. He passed slits in the wall and knew that the pallid lights he had seen through them were the moving bodies of the creatures as they went up and down these high-flung icy bridges. He managed to turn his head to look down and saw what was beneath him. The well of the tower plunged down a good five hundred feet to bedrock, widening as it went. The web of ice bridges and the spiral ways went down as well as up, and the creatures that carried him were moving smoothly along a transparent ribbon of ice no more than a yard in width, suspended over that terrible drop. Stark was glad that he could not move just then. One instinctive start of horror would have thrown him and his bearers to the rock below and would have carried Kiara with them. Down and down, gliding in utter silence along the descending spiral ribbon, the great glooming crystal grew remote above him. Ice was solid now in the slots of the walls. He wondered if they had brought Balan this way. There were other openings, wide arches like the one they had brought their captives through, and these gave Stark brief glimpses of broad avenues and unguessable buildings shaped from the pellucid ice and flooded with a soft radiance that was like eerie moonlight. At length, on what Stark took to be the third level of the city, the creatures bore him through one of these archways into the streets beyond. Below him now was the translucent thickness of ice that formed the floor of this level, and the roof of the level beneath. 
He could see the blurred tops of delicate minarets, the clustering roofs that shone like chips of diamond. Above him was an icy roof. Elfin spires rose toward it, delicate as needles. Lacy battlements and little domes, buildings star-shaped, wheel-shaped, the fantastic lovely shapes of snow crystals, frosted over with a sparkling foam of light. The people of the city gathered along the way to watch, a living, shifting rainbow of amethyst and rose and green against the pure blue-white, and there was no least whisper of sound anywhere. For some distance they went through a geometric maze of streets, and then there was a cathedral-like building, all arched and spired, standing in the center of a twelve-pointed plaza. Here they turned and bore their captives in. Stark saw a vaulted roof, very slim and high, etched with a glittering tracery that might have been carving of an alien sort, delicate as the weavings of spiders. The feet of his bearers were silent on the icy paving. At the far end of the long vault sat seven of the Shining Ones in high seats marvelously shaped from the ice, and before them, gray-faced, shuddering with cold and not noticing it, drugged with sick horror, stood Balin. He looked around once and did not speak. Stark was set on his feet, with Kiara beside him. He saw her face, and it was terrible to see the fear in her eyes that had never shown fear before. He himself was learning why men went mad beyond the gates of death. Chill, dreadful fingers touched him expertly. A flash of pain drove down his spine, and he could stand again. The seven who sat in the high seats were motionless, their bright tendrils stirring with infinite delicacy, as though they studied the three humans who stood before them. Stark thought he could feel a cold, soft fingering of his brain. It came to him that these creatures were probably telepaths. They lacked organs of speech, and yet they must have some efficient means of communications. Telepathy was not uncommon among the many races of the solar system, and Stark had had experience with it before. He forced his mind to relax. The alien impulse was instantly stronger. He sent out his own questing thought, and felt it brush the edges of a consciousness so utterly foreign to his own that he knew he could never probe it, even had he had the skill. He learned one thing, that the shining, faceless ones looked upon him with equal horror and loathing. They recoiled from the unnatural human features, and most of all, most strongly, they abhorred the warmth of human flesh. Even the infinitesimal amount of heat radiated by their half-frozen human bodies caused the ice-folk discomfort. Stark marshaled his imperfect abilities and projected a mental question to the Seven. What do you want of us? The answer came back, faint and imperfect, as though the gap between their alien minds was almost too great to bridge, and the answer was one word. Freedom! Balin spoke suddenly. He voiced only a whisper, and yet the sound was shockingly loud in that crystal vault. They have asked me already. Tell them no, Stark. Tell them no. He looked at Kiara then, a look of murderous hatred. If you turn them loose upon Kushat, I will kill you with my own hands before I die. Stark spoke again, silently, to the seven. I do not understand. Again the struggling, difficult thought. We are the old race, the kings of the glacial ice. Once we held all the land beyond the mountains, outside the pass you call the Gates of Death. Stark had seen the ruins of the towers out on the moors. He knew how far their kingdom had extended. We controlled the ice. Far outside the polar cap, our towers blanketed the land with the dark force drawn from Mars itself. 
from the magnetic field of the planet, that radiation bars out heat from the sun and even from the awful winds that blow warm from the south. So there was never any thaw. Our cities were many, and our race was great. Then came Ban Krushak from the south. He waged a war against us. He learnt the secret of the crystal globes, and learned how to reverse their force and use it against us. He, leading his army, destroyed our towers one by one and drove us back. Mars needed water. The outer ice was melted. Our lovely cities crumbled to nothing, so that creatures like Ban Krushak might have water, and our people died. We retreated to the last, to this, our ancient polar citadel, behind the gates of death. Even here Ban Krushak followed, he destroyed even this tower once at the time of the thaw, but this city is founded in polar ice, and only the upper levels were harmed. Even Ban Krushak could not touch the heart of the eternal polar cap of Mars. When he saw that he could not destroy us utterly, he set himself in death to guard the gates of death with his blazing sword, that we might never again reclaim our ancient dominion. That is what we mean when we ask for freedom. We ask that you take away the sword of Ban Krushak, so that we may once again go out through the gates of death. Stark cried aloud hoarsely, No! He knew the barren deserts of the south, the wastes of red dust, the dead sea bottoms, the terrible thirst of Mars, growing greater with every year of the million that had passed since Ban Krushak locked the gates of death. He knew the canals, the pitiful waterways that were all that stood between the people of Mars and extinction. He remembered the yearly release from death, when the spring thaw brought the water rushing down from the north. He thought of these cold creatures going forth, building again their great towers of stone, sheathing half a world in ice that would never melt. He thought of the people of Jakara, of Volkis and Barakish, of the countless cities of the south, watching for the flood that did not come, and falling at last to mingle their bodies with the blowing dust. He said again, No, never. The distant thought voice of the seven spoke, and this time the question was addressed to Kiara. Stark saw her face. She did not know the Mars he knew, but she had memories of her own, the mountain valleys of Mech, the moors, the snowy gorges. She looked at the shining ones in their high seats and said, If I take that sword... It will be to use against you, as Ban Krushak did. Stark knew that the Seven had understood the thought behind her words. He felt that they were amused. The secret of that sword was lost a million years ago. The day Ban Krushak died, neither you nor anyone now knows how to use it as he did. But the sword's radiations of warmth still lock us here. We cannot approach that sword, for its vibrations of heat slay us if we do. But you, warm-bodied ones, can approach it, and you will do so, and take it from its place. One of you will take it. They were very sure of that. We can see a little way into your evil minds. Much we do not understand. But the mind of the large man is full of the woman's image, and the mind of the woman turns to him. Also, uh, there is a link between the large man and the small man, less strong, but strong enough. The thought voice of the seven finished. 
The large man will take away the sword for us, because he must, to save the other two. Kiara turned to Stark. They cannot force you, Stark. Don't let them. No matter what they do to me, don't let them. Balin stared at her with certain wonder. You would die to protect Kushat? Not Kushat alone, though its people too are human, she said almost angrily. There are my red wolves, a wild pack, but my own. And others. She looked at Balin. What do you say? Your life against the Norlands? Balin made an effort to lift his head as high as hers, and the red jewel flashed in his ear. He was a man crushed by the falling of his world, and terrified by what his mad passion had led him into here beyond the gates of death. But he was not afraid to die. He said so, and even Kiara knew that he spoke the truth. But the seven were not dismayed. Stark knew that when their thought-voice whispered in his mind, "'Is not death alone you humans have to fear, but the manner of your dying. You shall see that before you choose.' Swiftly, silently, those of the ice-folk who had borne the captives into the city came up from behind where they had stood withdrawn and waiting. One of them bore a crystal rod like a scepter with a spark of ugly purple burning in the globed end. Stark leaped to put himself between them and Kiara. He struck out raging, and because he was almost as quick as they, he caught one of the slim, luminous bodies between his hands. The utter coldness of that alien flesh burned his hands as frost will burn. Even so, he clung on, snarling, and saw the tendrils writhe and stiffen as though in pain. Then, from the crystal rod, a thread of darkness spun itself to touch his brain with silence and the cold that lies between the worlds. He had no memory of being carried once more through the shimmering streets of that elfin evil city, back to the stupendous well of the tower, and up along the spiral path of ice that soared those dizzy hundreds of feet from bedrock to the glooming crystal globe. But when he again opened his eyes, he was lying on the wide stone ledge at ice level. Beside him was the arch that led outside. Close above his head was the control bank that he had seen before. Kiara and Balin were there also on the ledge. They leaned stiffly against the stone wall beside the control bank, and facing them was a squat, round mechanism from which projected a sort of wheel of crystal rods. Their bodies were strangely rigid, but their eyes and mind were awake, terribly awake. Stark saw their eyes, and his heart turned within him. Kiara looked at him. She did not speak, but she had no need to. No matter what they do to me. She had not feared the swordsmen of Kushat. She had not feared her red wolves when he unmasked her in the square. She was afraid now. But she warned him, ordered him not to save her. They cannot force you. Stark, don't let them. And Balin, too, pleaded with him for Kushat. They were not alone on the ledge. The ice folk clustered there, and out upon the flying spiral pathway, on the narrow bridges and the spans of fragile ice, they stood in hundreds watching, eyeless, faceless, their bodies drawn in rainbow lines across the dimness of the shaft. Stark's mind could hear the silent edges of their laughter, secret, knowing laughter, full of evil, full of triumph and Stark was filled with a corroding terror. He tried to move, to crawl toward Kiara, standing like a carbon image in her black mail. He could not. Again her fierce, proud glance met his, and the silent laughter of the ice-folk echoed in his mind, and he thought it very strange that in this moment now he should realize that there had never been another woman like her on all the worlds of the sun. 
the fear she felt was not for herself. It was for him. Apart from the multitudes of the ice folk, the group of seven stood upon the ledge, and now their thought voice spoke to Stark, saying, Look about you. Behold the men who have come before you through the gates of death. Stark raised his eyes to where their slender fingers pointed, and saw the icy galleries around the tower, saw more clearly the icy statues in them that he had only glimpsed before. Men set like images in the galleries, men whose bodies were sheathed in a glittering mail of ice, sealing them forever. Warriors, nobles, fanatics, and thieves— the wanderers of a million years who had dared to enter this forbidden valley and had remained forever. He saw their faces, their tortured eyes wide open, their features frozen in the agony of a slow and awful death. They refused us, the seven whispered. They would not take away the sword, and so they died as this woman and this man will die, unless you choose to save them. We will show you, human, how they died. One of the ice folk bent and touched the squat round mechanism that faced Balin and Kiara. Another shifted the pattern of control on the master bank. The wheel of crystal rods on that squat mechanism began to turn. The rods blurred, became a disk that spun faster and faster. High above, in the top of the tower, the great globe brooded, shrouded in its cloud of shimmering darkness. The disk became a whirring blur. The glooming shadow of the globe deepened, coalesced. It began to lengthen and descend, stretching itself down toward the spinning disk. The crystal rods of the mechanism drank the shadow in, and out of that spinning blur there came a subtle weaving of threads of darkness, a gossamer curtain, winding around Kiara and Balin, so that their outlines grew ghostly, and the pallor of their flesh was as the pallor of snow at night. And still Stark could not move. The veil of darkness began to sparkle faintly. Stark watched it, watched the chill motes brighten, watched the tracery of frost whiten over Kiara's mail, touch Balin's dark hair with silver. Frost, bright, sparkling, beautiful, a halo of frost around their bodies, a dust of splintered diamond across their faces, an aureole of brittle light to crown their heads. Frost, flesh, slowly hardening in marble whiteness as the cold slowly increased. And yet their eyes still lived and saw and understood. The thought voice of the seven spoke again. You have only minutes now to decide. Their bodies cannot endure too much and live again. Behold their eyes and how they suffer. Only minutes, human. Take away the sword of Ban Krushak. Open for us the gates of death, and we will release these two alive. Stark felt again the flashing stab of pain along his nerves as one of the shining creatures moved behind him. Life and feeling came back into his limbs. He struggled to his feet. The hundreds of the ice folk on the bridges and galleries watched him in an eager silence. He did not look at them. His eyes were on Kiara's, and now her eyes pleaded. Don't, Stark, don't barter the life of the Norlands for me. The thought voice beat at Stark, cutting into his mind with cruel urgency. Hurry, human! They are already beginning to die. Take away the sword and let them live. Stark turned. He cried out in a voice that made the icy bridges tremble. I will take the sword. 
He staggered out then, out through the archway, across the ice, toward the distant corn that blocked the gates of death. End of chapter 8